Hello everybody, I'm Pa from Sabaton. And I'm Andy Nidell. And you're watching Sabaton History Channel on tour. Okay, on tour? Where are we? We're in Mora on the Great Swedish Tour Part 2. Part 2. But before we talk about that, we're gonna talk about something else. Take it away, Andy. I'm gonna start today with a quotation from Richard Van Emden's Boy Soldiers of the Great War. We had another lad killed the last day in the trenches, and the circumstances are particularly sad, for he was only 16 years of age. On Monday night, I was sitting warming myself by the coke fire, and young Crowther was sitting there too, and he looked so young and childlike as he nodded with sleepiness over the fire. Young Crowther was one of the sentries, and I gave the usual order, next relief there. I had only just got into the next bay when I heard a call, stretcher bearers. I turned and rushed back. And there was the poor lad face down in the trench, reddening the water all round with his blood. He only lived about 10 minutes. The shot entered his back, piercing the lung and bursting the main artery. So ended another young life in the twinkling of an eye. 16 years old when I went to the wall to fight for a land fit for heroes. God on my side and a gun in my hand Chasing my days down to zero In the summer of 1914, the great majority of soldiers going to war did so in the belief of a short, victorious campaign. They would be home before the leaves fell, most certainly before Christmas at any rate. This expectation led to hundreds of thousands of volunteers rushing into the recruitment offices of their respective armies, all wanting to be part of this grand adventure. But not all of them were grown adults. A sizable portion of these volunteers were young teenagers and underage boys, 13, 14, 15, 16 years old, that slipped through the cracks and got sent to the front. Soon the trenches of the Great War were filled with both the young and the old, but an enemy shell did not respect the difference in age. Throughout history, armies always had their boys with them. These might be the drummers, pipers, and buglers, teenagers who maybe suffered from abusive parents or, or, or terrible work environment, often saw the armed forces as a last resort to escape their unhappy lives. And remember, in the 19-teens, Working class kids would leave school at the age of 14 or 15 to find employment or apprenticeship. Only the privileged would remain in schools until they were 18 to 21. But the Great War, the opposite of dull civilian life, attracted both groups equally. In fact, there were many politicians and aristocrats that willingly sent their young sons to the front lines to fulfill a sense of duty. Prominent among them was Belgian King Albert, who said, I want no special treatment for my son. Let him work in the trenches. He has to know how it feels to have blisters on his hands. Belgian Crown Prince Leopold was only 13 when he joined the Belgian 12th Line Regiment. Of course, this was mostly a publicity stunt, but Leopold would actually experience the trenches and come under enemy shell fire. So, so mostly isn't entirely. Back then, the demands of the monarchy, the church, and the army for obedience and discipline were pretty universal and they were intertwined with society. Each classroom would proudly display paintings of famous military leaders or decisive battles to remind students about their nation's glorious history. The armed forces were seen as bulwarks of security and identity. Maybe nowhere was this more apparent than in Imperial Germany. I mean, it was not by chance that the sailor suit was the most popular dress for young boys at the time. Teachers and professors also played a huge part in stirring up patriotic fervor among the youth, who longed to get their chance for glory worth remembering. This dream was soon shattered on the battlefields of the Great War. The Battle of Langemark in November 1914 was quickly dubbed by the German public as the murder of children and the death of innocence. 
Here, a myth began to take root that thousands of barely trained teenagers and young students were cut down by the older professionals of the British Expeditionary Force. Now, the official recruitment age in those days was between 18 and 21 in pretty much all of the warring nations. At that age, you were considered a grown adult, ready to make your own decisions, and were a man in his prime to serve in the armed forces. In peacetime, if you wanted to join up, there would be strict questioning, a general test of the senses, followed by an extensive medical examination. But in the turmoil and the chaos of the Great War, there was little time for that. The armies at the front were bleeding out, and they needed ever more men to fill the gaps. There were many cases where recruiters were even actively told to not be too strict with their demands. If a candidate looked physically fit enough to keep up with the strains of soldiery, then he was most likely waved through. Of course, officially there was a minimum height requirement, as well as necessary weight and chest measurements, but teenagers well, they can be huge and muscled for their age, especially if they were apprentices on a, on a farm or in the metal industry or something like that. Even the thin, the pasty-faced, the dull-eyed and pigeon-chested, though, were not necessarily excluded by more dubious recruiters. After all, a couple regular meals and a healthy lifestyle of exercise and fresh air would surely turn these youths into proper soldiers. The youngest soldier in the British Army was Sidney Lewis, who enlisted at just 12 years old. Sidney fought at the Somme in the huge offensives there, in the bloody Battle of Delville Wood. Since he had enlisted under a fake name and address, his mother only found out his whereabouts by meeting one of his comrades who was home on leave. She promptly went to the war office, showed them her son's real birth certificate, and got him discharged. But why did a 12-year-old boy go to war in the first place? Well, the minimum height requirement for the British Army was only 160 centimeters. That's five foot three. And Sidney was tall and heavily built for his age. But since information was often taken at face value, a fake identity was, it was hard to disprove. I mean, there were no computers with the internet to, to cross-reference a name or, or double-check if the given age was correct. And even if a boy was turned down, by a more cautious recruiter. There was nothing stopping him from trying another recruiting office the next town over. This eagerness might seem strange to us, especially with the benefit of hindsight, but we have to remember that each and every one was suddenly involved with this enormous, all-encompassing war. From kindergarten to university, they were exposed to the constant propaganda. Parents and neighbors constantly talked about the war, and newspapers and magazines were falling all over each other with the newest stories and most exclusive photographs from the front. The store sold tons of wooden guns and swords, and children played Germans and French with replica uniforms. France's youth, especially, was gripped by the omnipresence of the war, being under invasion, and with a deep-seated Germanophobia. It was always assumed that one day, some generation would avenge the humiliation of 1871 and return Alsace-Lorraine to the nation. Magazines were not shy of presenting their audience the Petit Bleu, the teenage soldier clad in the blue uniform of the Poilu, going off to fight the Bosch, to fight the Hun. A battle near La Basse in May 1915 was described as follows. Two French battalions of the line headed the charge, mostly formed of the youngest recruits. The Bavarians held their ground and fought gamely. The youngest soldiers of France rushed the machine guns at no matter what loss, emptied their magazines into the crowded trenches, and then jumped in and fought with the bayonet. In Imperial Russia, although the official draft age was 19, there were reportedly thousands of teenagers dropping out of school to join the regiments at the front. Girls as well would cut off their hair and put on men's clothing to try and join. Medical examinations, if they happened at all, were often just a formality and hastily done. So a teenager with broad shoulders and an acceptable weight and height was good enough to serve in the artillery or carry boxes of ammo for the machine gunners. The Cossacks had a strong tradition of teenagers learning how to ride and fight on horseback. Same went for the guard regiments, where the rich and important enrolled their sons to serve the czar as well as their own resumes. There were 
also several frontline units that deployed children as spies, since they were considered less suspicious when they were roaming the countryside between the front lines. War naturally produced more than enough orphans that were left to their own fate. Eight-year-old Momchilo Gavric was one of them and became most likely the youngest soldier in uniform during the war, wearing that of the Royal Serbian Army. His family was killed by members of the advancing Croatian Home Guard, who burned down their house. Gavric found his way to a Serbian artillery battalion who officially adopted him. He would witness battle, was given his own uniform, and even formally promoted to corporal and eventually to lance sergeant. Such sons of the regiment were not uncommon, especially in places where the front was not as clear cut as in the West. In the Ottoman Empire, Children had always played a great part when it came to generating patriotism among the populace. Teenagers dressed for war stood at the forefront of ceremonies honoring the fallen. Orphans especially were stylized as, as the lasting symbols of sacrifice, as they became the sons and daughters of martyrs. The vast majority of Ottoman teenagers were also left unschooled during the war. Instead, they were taken up by paramilitary associations like the Strength Association or the Youth League. All of the warring nations had such outdoor youth clubs and scout movements, often with semi-military undertones. Here, the children wore their own uniforms, badges, and flags. They marched through the country singing patriotic songs or sat together at campfires, sharing stories of military legends and war heroes, stories which the boy soldiers wanted to experience themselves in the great war of their time. Yet these would very often not have the happy ending they wished for. And someday that war would end one way or the other. But most soldiers would carry both internal and external scars forever with them. If the violence and horrors could break grown men, then it would most certainly affect the minds of the young. Indeed, many teenagers who came back after months or even just weeks at the front were unable to return to society. Often they were left in a pathological state of trauma and shock. How could anyone expect them to return to school or apprenticeship after witnessing all the death and destruction? Tough to say if these were really the unlucky ones though, as the graveyards of the Great War are certainly full with graves of underage soldiers. Fake identities mean that we can never be sure how many actually fought and died, and many, many parents would never find their teenage son's final resting place. Okay, now we said we are, we are in Mura, which is in Sweden. Um, and tell us a little bit about this tour and why we're here and what we're doing. This is the second part of yeah. the great Swedish tour. Okay. We did 30 shows, 30 cities in Sweden. Yeah. Very few bands do that. Most, they do Stockholm, Gothenburg, maybe a yeah. few more, but we did 30. Yeah. And after we did 30, we thought it was so fun, so we found another 20 more cities, including here in Mora, which is where we also decided that that's where we're gonna film the Sabaton History Channel. So that's why I came up from Stockholm, so that we can do this today. But I, I, I saw you guys play at the beginning. I saw you in Eskilstuna last yeah. time. Yeah, that was fun. Now, um, what is so different then, or what is so much fun about touring Sweden as opposed to an international tour? Yeah. It's quite a lot of different, you know, we get to play a, a little bit different set. Yeah. Uh, we play more songs in Swedish than we normally do from Carolus Rex. And we're touring with a stage set that we're currently sitting in that looks very different from what we normally do. You see, we're not sitting on a tank this we time. We are not sitting on a tank this time. We're not surrounded by barbed wire, which, which is what we like at home even, you know, we're so used to it. <laughs> Keep barbed wire by the bed at home. My wife goes crazy, but what the heck, you know, <laughs> realism. And so it's a little bit different. And uh, the whole idea about this tour was born a little bit about the corona. You know, people shouldn't travel during corona, so we travel to them. Right. And uh, um, and also to make smaller shows in order to, yeah, not have super events, you know. Yeah. 
So that was the plan with the idea why we started. Now we are, of course, a couple of years later. Now we're just doing it because we love it so much. And you're really playing like everywhere. I mean, 50 Swedish places, or that's a lot. Yeah, we play a lot of them, which very few bands have ever been to before. We started a tour in uh, Över Tornio. Which I've never been to. And very few people have been. Yeah. <laughs> and now we are here, uh, after a few days, we're here in Mora, which yeah. you've never been. Uh, no, I have been to Mora, actually. Yeah, to... I've never played in Mora. Ah. I, uh, the, uh, Mora was actually, when I first came to Stockholm in 1996, um, a guy I knew was going skiing in Lufstalen. And the first time I'd ever been skiing in my life, it took me through Mora. I couldn't speak any Swedish. I'd only been in Sweden for like three weeks. This is the second time, 25 years later, that I've been in Mora. But even like, I've toured a lot with Swedish bands around Sweden. I, I think I've played in like every town in Sweden. I've never played in Mora. But you've been skiing in Mora. Did you ski the Vasaloppet? I did not ski the Vasaloppet. No. For anybody who doesn't know what Vasaloppet is, it's the biggest skiing competition in the entire world. And the finish line of that one is here. They yeah. go actually 90 kilometers. Yeah. And it's in the, in the ancient uh, tracks. Yeah. Uh, even though it's opposite direction they go now, but uh, it's in the ancient tracks 500 years ago. This year. This year. Oh, wow. I didn't realize it was, it was this year. Was the, of course this year is the 500th anniversary. Yeah, yeah of course. So uh, of uh, when the Swedish who was not yet a king. Yeah, but going to be king. Going, going to be soon Christopher. to be king. <laughs> went yeah. uh, by skiing um, to um, escape from the Danish uh, king. As you do. As you do, and uh, rally uh, supporters. And it worked out. It worked <laughs> out pretty well. Man. Have you ever done Vasaloppet? I have not done Vasaloppet. Do you like skiing? I like skiing. I skied a lot when I was younger. I was competing in skiing when yeah. I was younger. And uh, a long time ago, when we had the World Ski Championship in Fallen, I was a small part of the opening ceremony where I ran out to the uh, bubo and gave it to one of the Swedish kings, and then we skied out of the stadium. That sounds kind of cool. You don't happen to have a video of that, do you? Uh, maybe it exists in the Swedish television's no, archive okay, yeah, somewhere, but can... I don't have it. Uh, I don't think that anybody else were allowed to bring a camera in there oh, or yeah. whatever, and, or anybody had a camera by then. Okay. <laughs> now, when you guys are on a tour like this, you have a few days off every now and then. Do you guys, do you guys ever go skiing between shows? Uh, did we ever go skiing between the shows? Um, I think it has happened. Actually, it has happened. Um, and uh, we were kind of considering doing it yesterday just for the fun of it. Yeah, well, uh, because fun. we're here, but the uh, weather was absolutely shitty. Oh, okay. Do you prefer slalom or do you do cross country or what do you like? I prefer cross country. Yeah. Uh, I think it's more uh, um, more my thing. Okay. I'm not so much for going super fast. Okay. I'm more for going and enjoying the ride. Yeah, no, I, I get you. I get you. Now, okay, since we're not on a tank and since we wanted to go around the stage, can you talk us around the stage and show us some of the things we're looking at? Yeah, I mean, uh, this one reflects more the Swedish historical park, uh, even though maybe this castle that we are currently sitting in is maybe not historically accurate looking Swedish castle. Right. We kind of had to make it exciting looking as well and fit it into the kind of structures that we have around us. But uh, we're sort of sitting on a, on a, like a stairs up to the throne where, yep. where the drums are. Or King Hannes. In a, in a King Hannes. Uh, and uh, because it, quit on the <laughs> <laughs> and he's surrounded by his uh, royal guards, of course, who is guarding his uh, his uh, royal uh, ass when he's sitting and playing. You the guys drums. know everything about them. They know about their history, of course. Yes, of Talk course. Talk about them. And uh, um, yeah, I think we we dress the whole stage in a very different from what we ever toured yeah. in the past, and uh, making it fit for this specific tour. Now. Since you're playing smaller places, they probably like when you played like way up in Norland, it probably people come from a lot of places, a lot of smaller places. How small are the smaller shows and how, because you guys used to playing 10, 20, 30, 40,000 people. How, what's the difference in size here? What are the smaller I mean, and bigger he, ones? Here, this is one of the smaller ones. Tonight yeah. we have about 1,000 people here. And uh, it's, it's pretty good to get to see you guys in front of only a thousand people. Yeah, That's and cool. uh, yeah, it's a smaller, uh, smaller style arena. We are on this tour, we are not doing the huge scale arenas. We're doing a little bit smaller arenas and uh, most of the place are around 2000. Okay. And have you been, <coughs> excuse me, do you ever 
do you guys have you been going you know back to fall and occasionally between dates or are you really just doing it on tour, tour we were discussing several of us that yesterday because we were so close to home that yeah. we would drive home but it's in the beginning of the tour there's yeah. still some things we need to fix to work on yeah. to fine tune that's why we needed to stay with, with the with the rest of the crew um interestingly enough though since you're doing all these shows you're not playing in stockholm on this tour that is true why uh, is that because we have another show in Stockholm where yeah. we don't have this set. Yeah. Where we have the big set with but, tanks. But that's on your full European tour yeah. where you play all the capitals and everything. Yeah. And when is that? That's April and May. April, so. May. Okay. Yeah. So this whole springtime is going to be big touring. Yes. And the summer? Uh, uh, the summer, uh, it's going to be a little bit more quiet for us than usual when it comes to touring. Yeah. But we'd be busy anyway. We always have stuff to do. Yeah, you've got to record the Great War Volume 3, obviously. <laughs> You could do, you could literally do ten albums about the Great War and not run out of songs. That is true. Wow. We, we are well aware of that. But at some point, we also need to look to some other historical part of the history. You know what? I just, was just just thinking when you're touring Sweden, obviously Joachim speaks Swedish between songs. That is a difference that's as well. That's not what he does in, say, England. No, right? no. That's uh, that be funny in both. Actually, I'm not funny in Swedish. The worst thing is. I think I'm funny in Swedish, <laughs> but I'm not. So, but Yuki, Yuki is funny in English and, and in Swedish, and that works out. Yep. So the band is all here now. This is afternoon when we're shooting this, by the way, guys. We shot three episodes, three regular episodes, um, and I changed clothes between them even though it's the same location because continuity, right? Um, and so we've got a couple hours before the show. What are we going to do? Um, maybe there are going to be some sound checking here. Oh, maybe, yeah, yeah. So some yeah. some crew members gonna need the stage, and uh, today uh, there is uh, uh, some stuff. I was earlier at the museum here okay. under Sorn uh, painter, yeah, and there was a Viking. I like under Sorn. There was a Viking uh, exhibition there. Oh, cool! I was actually I went to National Museum on Saturday. Mm -hmm. I just I woke up with my wife in the morning and I'm kind of tired because we had a late night Friday and I was lying in bed and I'm like we should go to a museum today. And I, but I hadn't been since they reopened it and stuff. Yeah. And it's, it's, uh, that's a good one. We get sidetracked easily, me and Cara. <laughs> a, a, a lot of people always, uh, they say, oh, you're in this town, you need to go and see this museum and this museum. And uh, there's so many museums that we never been to. Yeah. And most of the time, I'm not so excited to go to a museum either, okay. because if there is nobody there to tell the full story behind it, yeah. Yeah. normally you're just looking at some object yeah. and reading a little sign. And that's it. You don't get the full context of it. Yeah. But if you would know, and if you have somebody who's interested in it with you, tells you why, then yeah, yeah. everything turns to be something different. Yeah. And a tips for any of you guys who sometimes invite us to uh, museums when we are coming on tour to your city, is to come up with a great guide as well, uh, because a great guide is what makes a great museum. Now we've talked about possibly in the future about me following you guys on a tour one day and doing some historical tours of the different places. That'd be kind of cool, but that'll be in the future. Oh, one quick question though, um, about the song. Are you playing it live already? We haven't decided yet if we're gonna play that song live on this tour. Okay. I mean, obviously here, when we're filming this, yeah. none of you have ever heard the song, mm -hmm. and we're not gonna spoil it tonight here in Mora. No, no, no. Um, but when, um, when you are... Uh, when you are watching this, yeah. the song is out. Maybe we are playing it on tour. We don't know yet. It's a little bit up to how the people, you know, receive a song and if the people like it. Yeah, it's hard not to like. I mean, I love the song, you know, from the beginning, and I've heard your version of it, and I think it's a really great cover, great homage, good all around. And, and that's why we're doing three episodes about it. Yes, it deserves it, it. It needs it. It's a it's a little bit different vibe over it as well. Yeah, totally, totally. Well, it's different for them to do, and it's different for you to do. Yeah. So. Okay, well, that is it for today. Thank you for watching, and hope to see you soon again here on Sabaton History.
Thanks for watching this episode of Sabaton History Channel. Please remember to click that little bell so that you get notifications the next time we release an episode. Also remember to subscribe and then we will see each other in the future. Thank you.